This is Michael Matheson Miller, and you are listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. So I'm delighted to have on the show today, Jeremy Tate. Jeremy, thanks for joining the Moral Imagination Podcast. Hey, Michael. Thrilled to be here. We've been trying to schedule this for a while. So let's, you are the founder of the Classic Learning Test. Let's just start maybe big picture. What is the Classic Learning Test? Uh, why does it matter? And why'd you do it? Yeah, I always give the disclaimer. Uh, you know, when you, when you hear somebody about to talk about standardized testing, it's going to be like, this is going to be the most boring hour ever. Who cares about standardized testing? But standardized testing is actually, you know, the lever uh, that drives a lot of what happens in secondary schools in America. Uh, The really crass way to think of it is that whoever owns testing kind of ends up owning education uh, to a large degree. And so what I saw six, seven years ago when I was a college counselor working at a a faithfully dynamic Catholic school, Mountain of Sales Academy in in Catonsville, Maryland, was that the Dominican sisters there had this beautiful vision for education but the power of the college board definitely had an influence. Everything these schools do to kind of market themselves comes from college board. You know, how many AP classes do you have? How many national merit? What's your average PSAT score, SAT score? And this is a, a company that has a really utilitarian vision for education. And they censor really any Christian Catholic intellectual source material almost completely. So the idea is, what if there was a competitor to the college board that instead of driving curriculum, away from the tradition that gave birth to America, that there was a competitor that was driving education towards that tradition. Well, and that's interesting because, you know, you started it from a Catholic school, but many Protestant schools use it. And in fact, I think, is it true that both secular, non-Christian universities and high schools use it for their testing? Is that correct? More and more, you know, I think especially on the university side, the test is not just uh, you know, an evaluative tool, but it's also the way that students get connected and discover great universities. So I think universities are quickly discovering that students that are coming out of these great classical Christian schools or home schools, they're special students. They've had an exceptional academic formation. So I think that's made CLT really attractive uh, to colleges uh, as well. So let's uh, talk just a little bit more about the basics. So I think, I mean, you said something that I want to dive into, which is if you own the test, you own education. I think, and that that's part of your strategy of, of we, if we're going to transform education uh, away from this increasingly hyper utilitarian secularist yeah. vision, well, we can't just build schools which are opt out options, which we all mm-hmm. obviously have to do. And like, you know, I interviewed Heidi White, who, you know, who's working at a classical school. I've talked to other people about education, but we also have to, in a sense, engage in the system. And part of the system is yeah. if people want to go to college, they're standardized tests for colleges. And so you created this alternative to standardized tests. How many people, I'm sorry, how many universities take are using this right now? You know, a lot of the universities quickly went test optional. Uh, so we're partnered with about 200. Um, you know, you had very quickly last year, about 40% of universities in 2019 were test optional. Now it's about 95%. Some universities are already starting to go back to requiring a test for homeschool students. So we think the pendulum is going to swing back towards testing, but a lot of scholarships are tied to CLT scores as well, especially top like presidential kind of scholarships. It's also used as uh, an internal metric. So most schools that administer the CLT, the fact that it's a college entrance exam as well is kind of a secondary thought. They really use it as an internal metric. If you're a classical school, it's the only test out there that can really say, well, how how do your kids do reading great philosophy or classical literature? Yeah. So, and maybe I want to, I want to go back into also like how you began to develop it, but I think one of, maybe give some of the differences. So you've got the SAT and the ACT. And then yeah. the, the CLT, the classic learning test. And I think you you and I talked about this before, that it's not a classical learning test, right? It's not about mm-hmm. classical learning. So mm-hmm. y- you don't have to go to a classical school to be able to take this test, right? It What you're doing is you're bringing in readings from beyond like Greek yogurt or <laughs> uh, I, thought uh-huh. one, I thought it was one of the articles like, yeah. or, or co-working or, you know, to actually reading Burke and Madison and John Paul II, and as you said, and Darwin and Nietzsche, yeah. I and mean, you're reading through the tradition. So it, part of it's what's testing is, can a student read a serious text well? Is that part of it? 
Yep, yep. And and you're right. We chose classic very intentionally, not classical. So almost every news article that has ever come out on the CLT, it comes out as the classical learning test. And we call and we say, that's not the name. Can you please change it back to the classic learning test? And they'll, they'll usually very quickly make that edit. But what we were thinking, I was actually thinking of like Coca-Cola classic. So you may know the story, but you know, they had a great beverage that everybody loved and they did something funny with the recipe and people weren't happy. So they rebranded and they added classic saying, we're going back to the genuine article. You know, that's what we're doing as well. There's no Greek, there's no Latin on the CLT, but what we want to do is put students in front of the kind of source material that was always at the center of a great American education or really any great education in the West. So let's talk a little bit more about it. I mean, like one of the things that we have today with learning is that in many ways, students are excluded from the texts that were at the founding of West, or, or sorry, that are at the core of Western civilization and the founding of the United States. So yeah. in a sense, like that the test, the SAT and ACT, the school board, the college board test have in a sense followed it. So you make this point, I mean, explain it to me because I, I don't know. You make this point in one sense, makes sense to me, right? If you own the test, people are educating their students so they can get really good test scores so they can get into good colleges. And that's what parents are concerned about. So everything yeah. kind of becomes this like college funnel. So, but you also have schools that are intentionally moving away from say Western civilization curriculum from universities to high schools, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. remember like Stanford, what was it like, you know, hey ho, Western culture's gotta go or something. Yeah. So <laughs> so and what the classic learning test is actually because you're the test takers have to read these complex things, then it's in creating incentives for the schools and the parents to actually have their their students read difficult texts to get that them going. I mean, develop like how did you think about yeah. this? Where are we going? Am I am I understanding you? What's going on? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting, Michael. You you can go back and look at uh, the 1859 Harvard College Entrance Exam. It's very interesting. You know, basically they're just translating into Greek and Latin, but it was very reflective of what a great education meant right before the Civil War, right in the in the middle of the 19th century there. And so it's a good question, right? Does do the test drive and shape what happens in the classroom or do the test just merely reflect what's already happening in the classroom? I think it probably cuts both ways, right? And so ACT over the years has been very intentional in trying to say, we don't drive curriculum. What we do is we survey what's going on in classrooms and we want to be using you know, source material that would be fair of what a student is has been taught during their high. I think the college board, you know, historically has been more on on the other side of of wanting to be intentional as a driver, and that's where CLT comes. You know, from our, our frame as well. I, I remember I actually ran an SAT ACT prep company when I was starting to dream of of this idea, and I remember just working with students on these painfully meaningless passages. I mean, there's never a time a student is more dialed in than when they're testing, right? And it also conveys to students like what's really important. And I'd say 99% of America has no idea how radical, really, really radical the, the te America's testing establishment is. And so I think it started off with kind of a well-intended sensitivity committees, you know, but it's at the point now, and I, I've met so many people who work for these companies where you can't have a boy or a girl mentioned, right? Because that would be uh, offensive, I guess, to non-binary folks or, or whatnot. You can't have a married couple. That would be offensive to, to, you know. And so they end up in the name of sensitivity, driving out anything worth reading at all, you know? And so the tests end up being a driver for basically complacency, that education itself is just boring, you know? At CLT, we take kind of the opposite approach entirely. We say, look, if a text could never be offensive to anybody, it's probably not very important either. And let's avoid putting that on our test. What we want to do instead is say, what were the tests that drove and shaped culture and history? And those are the kinds of authors that we're, we're now putting in front of tens of thousands uh, of students every year. You know, it's interesting as you bring this about, like it's not just boring, which is a big problem, but it's also a political and cultural indoctrination, right? Yep. And so, and if you think about it, it's not just an indoctrination of everybody, it's an indoctrination of the elites. 
And I'll, I want to get into that a little bit because one of the critiques of this test and of classical edu- classical education is, oh, it's elitist. And I, mm-hmm. I've talked to Heidi White about this. So on another podcast for listeners, if they're interested, but specifically with classical education, but on the classic test, this kind of question of elites, I think interesting as you talked, I'm thinking about it, right? Okay. So <clears throat> the college board, now that's the SAT, right? The college board. That's correct. Clear. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so there's the ACT is its own thing. And then the a- AC, the SAT is the college board. And as you said, they have intentionally, in a sense, tried to drive learning in a specific way. And you said they're quite radical. Now, I want you to talk about that in a minute, but it, it's interesting what, as you talked, I thought about it. So, okay. So the testing is going to set certain political parameters of how to think. Yep. And then they're yep. going to read specific things. And now everybody from the elite prep schools that cost 25, 30, $40,000 a year to the best government, you know, public high schools to the Catholic schools, everybody's like, well, we've got to get really good scores on the SAT so that we can get our, our students into, into good colleges. And so everybody's moving towards this in a sense, being shaped in political indoctrination so mm-hmm. that they can get a good test score. And now you have, and this is partially a statement and a question. Yeah. You have, let's take the top 20 universities, the elite, the best students in the United States. And we're talking about America, but even across the world, but let's talk about the United States going to the top 20 schools. And none of them has been forced to read serious texts to get into these schools. Yeah. Now you get in to become the best scientist and you are essentially you, to use Alan Bloom's term, the American mind has been closed, right? Mm-hmm. You are a technician with no sense of history or uh, deep reflection on ethics or complexity or anything. I mean, it seems like it's a big, big problem that's, one, shaping elites to be com- disconnected from reality and from history. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> that's also, in a sense, so that's bad. But it's also bad because it's not serious. They're not serious. So they're like only, the only thing you can be serious about is technical education, Mm. but any other broader human education seems to be lost. I mean, what do you think about like, that's as you talked, I thought that like, what do you think, Jeremy? That's so well said. Uh, So the new president of our board here at CLT, Dr. Angel Parham Adams, uh, she's coming out with a new book very soon with Anika Prather called the black intellectual tradition. And, uh, Dr. Uh, Angel Parham Adams is a professor at the University of Virginia. Uh, She's a Yale undergrad. And she had this moment that she talks about where she realized that she was able to go from preschool through PhD without reading any Homer, any Plato, any uh, any Shakespeare. You nobody's required to the colleges have all gone a la carte, or a lot of them have, right? You have the few, you have the Christopher Newports and the Hillsdale and a whole laundry list of great Catholic schools like Benedictine and and Christendom and the Belmont Abbey and those kinds of schools. But the mainstream big research university, it's an a la carte model. They're not reading these kinds of texts. We've gone to informational texts as being the thing now in K-12 education. Sorry, what's that? What's an informational text? Sorry, Jeremy, what's an informational well, text? an informational text would be an example I mean, examples can be as ridiculous as literally like a vacuum cleaner manual, right? That's kind of the, pra- what, what, is it, what does a young person need? People get in these rooms, what does a young person need to be able to do? They need to be able to do things like read directions, right? So we don't, we don't need great literature for that. We don't need a great philosophy for that. So like that's an actual example is why I mentioned the vacuum cleaner manual. Informational text, though, all, also, I think this is a lever for the political kind of indoctrination, is that... They will put the hot button political issues on there and under the kind of the guise of informational text, you know. Right. And so rather than having two different perspectives on something like climate change, you know, where there's room for debate, you know, it'll be one perspective. And the student interprets that as, you know, kind of the only perspective because they've got to get the technical, answer right. technical, factual information, right? Because they've got the answer right. Yeah. Sorry, yep. keep going. Yeah, yeah, I- exactly. So, you know, the Common Core Standards, they make this arbitrary recommendation, right, that teachers end up complying with that I believe it's, yeah, 75% of all texts must be informational by senior year in high school, you know, and they, they want to make that transition. The irony here is that, I mean, what, what young person ever learned to love reading from informational texts? I mean, I'm sure there are some, but, you know, I've got young boys right now. It was Aesop's fables. It was Grimm's fairy tales. 
that made them excited about about reading. It was the Lord of the Rings, you know. It was the Chronicles of Narnia. And there's only one. Was. Sorry, I just there. I just I'm sorry. I think there's only one person who ever got excited about reading informational text. You know who that is? <laughs> there is. There's one is person. It, is it uh? Is it Einstein or Ben Franklin? It's Eustace Scrub. From oh, the Chronicles of Narnia. Who there read all it. the wrong books. Yeah, who read all the wrong books. Okay, so it's such a great... I'm sorry you brought that. It just struck me. It's so funny. Like, who who learned? Like, only used to scrub, right? So, and he's in a sense the model, right, of the abolition of man. Right? Mm. That man has been abolished, right? His patrimony has been stolen from him. So it's actually a kind of a... That Lewis point, it just struck me when you, when you gave that, that element and, and, of, of informational text. The other thing that strikes me and I'm sorry, I, I interrupted you, but since I have, I'm going to keep interrupting you and then I'll get you back on here. <laughs> but no, you're great. Yeah. It, it struck me too in this informational text, like a lot of this is from a professor I had in graduate school, but I, I've used it when I teach and other places about like looking at critical thinking and mm. what critical thinking equals. Well, part of it is like a, there's this twist that takes place that Lewis writes about in The Abolition of Man. But mm -hmm. it's very interesting. So like there's a, the opposite of a fact is said to be an opinion, right? Which is, first of all, incorrect because the opposite of a fact is a false proposition or uh -huh. right, a proposition about that does not obtain, right? So it's, and an mm. opinion, right, is like in the classic example of Plato, it's justified belief, right? And then when it becomes knowledge or a fact, then it's justified true belief. So the opposite of a fact is a false proposition. Mm. But in informational thinking, which is part of the whole kind of empiricist rationality, which we talk a lot about in this podcast, mm. is that, so what happens is people are given like tech, critical thinking tests. And I remember when my uh, children, my young, my, my older children, when they were like in fifth grade, he came home from a classical school with a critical thinking test. And the test was something to the effect of, and I talk about this in lectures, is, um, you know, like, Bach was born in Germany, fact or opinion. Bach wrote beautiful music, right? George Washington was the first president of the United I, States. I remember fact doing this, yeah. You remember those? Okay. Remember? Yeah. And then George Washington was a good president. Okay, opinion, mm -hmm. right? So I, I always like bell bottoms were popular in the 1970s, fact. Bell bottoms are cool, right? Opinion, right? And so, mm -hmm. so and what, connecting this back to Lewis, he said, what happens is in the child, in the student is they find themselves on the side of a philosophical controversy that they don't even know exists. Mm, yep. Right. Because what happens is, first of all, that's like a false element. And Bach, yes, was born in Germany. He also wrote beautiful music. That's not an opinion. That's a fact. Mm. But what's happened is all value judgments, yep. i.e. non-informational reading, are pushed out as mere opinion. Okay. Yep. And so the critical thinker, so now if you say like murder is bad, well, who's to say, right? It's just an opinion. And so what happens is like the test, it's very interesting because I didn't, like, I, I'm jumping in here because it struck me. It's not just the mm. bad education, the entire informational test where you said common course says 75% has to be informational. That means questions of truth are pushed to the side and you're just given information, which ultimately becomes indoctrination because your mm -hmm. critical thinking skills have been stolen from you. It very, it's very powerful. Like what that, like it, even just talking to you and I've talked before. And when we talked about this, I was, oh, I've got to get Jeremy on the podcast. But even as I'm listening to you, thinking about it now, I'm like, oh my goodness. Right. Like, and there's an, it's an entire indoctrination uh, program, as it were, that's yeah. done from the college oh, yeah. board. And here we thought we were just taking the SAT. Oh yeah. And, and by the way, Michael, I, I had to actually bring up the quote because I've been thinking about it now. So a few minutes ago, you, you, that, I, I'm so glad that you brought up Eustace Scrub. <laughs> and uh, that reference, uh, and I, I just laugh. You know, I, I also laugh when I read the Chronicles of Narnia that Lewis named the school Experiment House, and my children don't understand why. I think that's just so funny, but I think oh, he was yeah. absolutely understanding what happens when you strip all tradition out of education and this sacred act of passing down the best of what has been thought and said. That you end up with just experimentation, right? So here's the Eustace quote, uh, or the quote about Eustace, right? Uh, Most of us know what we should expect to find in a dragon's lair. But as I said before, Eustace had read only the wrong books. They had a lot to say about exports and imports and governments and drains, but they were weak on dragons. Such a fantastic quote. And 
yeah, th there's been one book in the past year that has shaped my thinking. I, I'd actually am embarrassed to admit it, had never read The Abolition of Man until this past year, even though I've been a Lewis junkie for 20 years and read it, finished it, and then I just started over again. And I think what Lewis does there is I think he kind of puts his finger on exactly what how mainstream modern education is now completely out of continuity. I think the way that Lewis describes it is that formerly, generation after generation, and this isn't even just a Western thing, right? Mm -hmm. That the job of the teacher was um, to get this, the pupil to understand and conform uh, to reality and be happy in doing so, right? And then the movement in modern education is to either deny or to bend reality around the desires, the appetites uh, of the student. And in the end, they're not happy uh, in that process. Well, yeah, it's, it's so good. Thanks for being So The Abolition of Man is one of my favorite books. So if there's probably some listeners who've heard me talk about like, oh no, don't do that. Like, don't talk about The Abolition of Man because I just love this book. Once I was yeah. teaching undergraduate, I had a student who said to me, she was like, have you ever given a lecture where you don't mention the abolition? <laughs> <laughs> she was teasing. I said, I hope not. But it's such a profound book. I really think it's one of the top mm -hmm. five books of the 20th century. It's so important. Yeah. He, it, it, not just for education, but like transhumanism. I mean, everything. I mean, he's just like very, mm -hmm. very solid. But, but I think a couple things that struck me as you talked about that, you know, Aquinas defines truth as conforming the mind to reality right? Mm. That's what truth is, conforming of the mind to reality. And you said, you know, in a sense, we're just bending reality to the appetites of the student, but it's actually worse than that. We're bending and deforming the students to the disordered appetites of adults who should actually be mm. training students for their own good, but instead are using them as tools for political purpose. Mm. I mean, I know that's harsh, but I mean, I think it's absolutely the tr truth. So you want to push back it's, or what do you think? It's bold. And I, yeah. And I think you're right. It's, it's a scary time. So one of the things that is um, also interesting you talked about is it's out of continuity. I mean, and so this kind of goes to a, a question, like you, you mentioned, um, what's the name of the book, the black intellectual tradition. I'll put a link to in the show notes. Is, is it out yet or it's coming out? It's not, it is not out. And I, I believe it comes out this summer. Okay, good. I'll have to get them on my podcast uh, to talk about this. It'd be great. So, yeah. you know, one of the kind of critiques of classic education and classical education and reading these texts, it, one of the, in a sense, sentimental, but nevertheless compelling arguments is like, look, that's just favoring wealthy, upper middle class mm. white people. Yeah, You know, it, what about all the other people? Yeah. And I think there's multiple reasons that that's a problem. This kind of goes back on praising your innovation on the test here, because by creating a classic learning test that you have to study for, well, the SAT is doing that. It's getting everybody to study for these things. What it actually, the classic learning test can do is it actually opens up Western civilization and the training to read all these very complex tests to prepare you for the 1859 Harvard exam, as it were, right? I know, I mean, I know it's a different thing, but like, yeah. you know, metaphorically, right? That if, say, poor schools in rural or urban areas that have, in a sense, been neglected or have been taken over by teachers' unions or whatever it might be, now they've got to study for the classic learning test and they have to read complex passages. You're not <clears throat> abusing them, you're opening them up. I think it's the beginning of the closing of the American mind. Maybe it's the, it, it's the, um, so a long time ago, it's, I think it's the intro by Saul Bellow, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the novelist. And it struck me this, so I'll, I'll probably get this wrong. It's so like deep in the back, but it, it still kind of struck me. I remember and stuck with me. He was, I think in his, I think this is where it is. He says, you know, he grew up kind of in Chicago, poor place. But through reading, it opened up its horizon, his horizons. He thought, there's more to the world. There's something I can do. Mm -hmm. And so being able to study classic texts, even things that are, are problematic, right? But like really wrestling with these fundamental questions of human life is not only good for our humanity, it opens up students beyond the provincial and it opens them up be beyond the immediate. So mm -hmm. it gives them a historical and a like an actual global 
not just a sentimental globalism, right? Yeah, but an yeah. actual perspective to think, wow, I mean, these are things that they're dealing with their own soul. So it's the opposite of kind of elite exclusionism. It's actually human inclusion, right? It's mm. welcome to the deepest questions of the human race. And let's have a discussion about them because you're part of that. That's your patrimony. As mm. opposed to what Lewis says, we're robbing them of their patrimony by turning education into indoctrination. What do you think? Yeah. 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 You know, the first three years I was out of college, out of Louisiana state, I spent teaching in inner city, uh, New York, and I was at progress high school, hundred percent minority community in three years. I, 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 I don't know that I had a single student who was being raised by a biological mother and father. Every student was being raised by an aunt or usually grandma was typically the one who was taking care of the children. Community w- was just broken. And the kind of education that they were being given was making it worse. And I thought about that when I visited Hope Academy in Minneapolis for the first time. Uh, And Hope Academy is a classical Christian school in the heart of one of the roughest areas in Minneapolis. And they intentionally recruit students coming out of the most broken situations, students whose parents maybe died in in, in gang violence. And then they do the most counterintuitive things imaginable. They teach them beautiful penmanship. They teach them oh, yeah. Latin, right? It, it's not what you would think. It's so counterintuitive, but they're creating something beautiful. And I toured the school and I met the students and I've never been so convinced that classical education is for our, all people because what it's fundamentally about is the cultivation of virtue and human flourishing at, you know, at the end of the day. So let, let's talk more about how this came about and this idea, like you, you started l- learning education. I mean, so let's maybe talk a little bit about your background. I mean, you've mentioned it kind of throughout, but to Louisiana state, and then you taught, by yeah. the way, I mean, it's kind of funny to be honest that you worked at a high school <laughs> called progress high school. And now that yeah. you've read the abolition of man, that's like the cousin to experimental school progress. Oh, yeah. Like, where are we going? Like, that's the, uh, by the way, that's a wonderful question of Lewis, like a, a kind of a Lewis has this question. I'm not sure where, I mean, I think it's abolition, man. Like progress is not going forward if you're going in the wrong direction. Yeah. That's from Lewis. So that, that's interesting, but let's, let's talk about like your kind of journey to get to this position. And one thing that's striking is you kind of did the impossible. It's kind of fun when you think about it. If somebody, oh, I think said, if I would have known the, the, the scope, you know, I, I think I thought it was an original idea. It wasn't a very original idea at all. In fact, I've, I've met with a ton of people over the years where, you know, even people who went as far as meeting with investors to do something very like the CLT and understanding that to change American education at a fundamental level, the testing establishment would have to be challenged, you know? Yeah. So a little bit of kind of about the, the backstory, you know, I, I grew up in the home of a teacher. My mom was a career Spanish teacher. Uh, I should be bilingual and I'm really not at all, but I'm, I'm getting better. I do my, my Duolingo every day. And, you know, I, I was going to be a pastor when I was at, at college at LSU, but I, I thought I would teach for a couple of years before going to seminary. So I, I taught for three years in New York City. Then I went off to Reform Theological Seminary. And, and uh, it was really during my time in seminary that I got a sense of like, oh, wow, Every other generation that had the luxury of the benefit of being educated, they received something entirely different. And what they were doing was really different. And so I remember, you know, it was often called formation, right? Yeah. They were forming, shaping people. And, uh, you know, I remember when I, when I graduated from seminary and I, I decided not to go the pastoral route and I went back in the classroom for a few years, I became really obsessed with the question, like, what even is education? what is it? What are we trying to do? You know? And I came to the conclusion that at least it had much more to do with moral formation and character formation than learning things, you know? And that had been almost entirely lost in my, you know, in my academic experience at Louisiana State majoring as a secondary education major hardly anything that even touched upon that as a purpose of education. It was mostly just like credentialing, kind of getting students through, right? It, there's so many unanswered questions for like, why are we even doing this whole crazy thing called education? So I had all of that kind of going when I, I got to Mount Sales Academy, a wonderful Catholic school where my daughter goes now, run by the Dominican sisters out of Nashville. 
had all this kind of in my head as I was seeing what I think was a very real tension between the college board and the power and the influence of the college board. But I was also a college counselor. And so I knew a number of people in admissions at small Catholic colleges, colleges like Magdalene or Thomas Aquinas College, John Daly over there, Christendom College. I knew all of these people in admissions. And so as I was looking at this really bizarre dynamic of, okay, here this, these students go, often from a great Catholic homeschool like Mother Divine Grace to a great Catholic school, and then they take an aggressively secular test to go to a passionately Catholic college. It just seemed like such a detour. Like, why are we doing this? And then there's all of these other impacts that the test has as well. So it was literally a matter of just kind of calling these people and saying, hey, if there was another test that was more reflective of the coursework students are doing their first year at Christendom or Benedictine or TAC, would you have interest? Would you use that test? And their response was like, of course, we hate the SAT and ACT. We would love a test like that. You know, and so now a school like Christendom, 90% of the students who go there and get accepted are taking the CLT. It's their preferred assessment. It's a way for the college to double down on kind of what they're about, you know. And, you know, I got to tell you, I think it's a very sad story for the way that Catholic education, Christian education has responded to the power and the influence of the college board. Mm -hmm. Because here you have the most powerful company in American education that truly censors the entire Catholic Christian intellectual tradition completely. And the way that Catholic high schools and Catholic colleges and Christian schools have all responded is just by writing checks to the college board, you know, of just continuing to kind of feed the beast. And so they can have these shiny credentials that make their institutions look good. So, you know, I, I think we were in the process of peeling back the layers of an onion and saying, oh, wow, like the, it's the test at the end of the day that the testing has so much of an influence. What if we could attack there and change there? So, yeah, it's been an incredible story. A lot of it also is a, it's been a way to just experience God's providence. Like we started with an idea. I didn't know anybody that had money or could invest or it had never run a serious company or anything. And it was kind of like God just kept amazing people kept showing up at just the right time to make this thing work. Yeah, you, that's great. I mean, it's a real feat. I mean, it's an entrepreneurial venture that it looks impossible and you did it. I mean, that's another, that's just another side of the story that maybe we can just for a second talk about, but I mean, it's great. I mean, it's really, I mean, it's the kind of thing that's inspiring because you like how, when you look at sometimes like the money and the power of secular institutions and you could call it like the commanding heights of culture, mm -hmm. you can get disappointed, you get discouraged. And so people start little things like, okay, we're going to start, you know, building our communities like I, I talk about the Tocqueville option, right? And, uh, you know, Rod Dreyer, the people talking about Benedict option. They, they, people start doing things. They're building, building communities and building schools. And I'm on the board of a classical school that uses the CLT. And those things are fantastic. And we got to keep doing a, a lot of those. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we think like, well, okay, but we're just going to like give it, like abdicate our like role in doing some of the bigger things. Now, some people say, oh, well, let's take over Harvard. Like, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> but what we can yeah. do is like provide better alternatives. So in a sense, hey, this is how I talk about classical education and, and education in general. Like a lot of times people will say, you know, well, they ask, you know, why are you not sending your children to, to government schools or whatever? Why are, you, why are you homeschooling? We've done a lot of different things or this school or that charter school or whatever, you know, they'll sometimes it'll be articulated sometimes by people who do that or by critics as a siege mentality, right? Like we're, we've got to just get away from the world. Mm -hmm. But I always say, it's not, a, I'm not in a siege. I think what you're doing is boring and stupid and unhelpful. And it doesn't help humans flourish. It doesn't provide the mm. conditions for children to flourish and have happy, productive lives. It, produces the conditions for them to be in a sense, you know, hyper technocrats, you know, and the most successful will okay become wealthy, but at the price of their soul often, not always, not always. I mean, obviously I'm speaking broadly, but my main point is like, and plus it's boring. Like I don't care about vacuum cleaners, you know, <laughs> let's read Homer yeah. and Augustine and even Nietzsche, right? Let's wrestle mm -hmm. with these fundamental questions. So in a sense, it's a positive view. We got to opt out and build better things. And that's one of the things I really like about what you did is that you said, look, we're just going to build something better than the SAT and the ACT. Mm -hmm. And for listeners, I might sound, oh, okay, 
yeah, he says this better. But actually, what's very interesting, and let's talk about this. You can give the data on this because mm-hmm. I, I know when we talked before <laughs> that when colleges who are using all three rank SAT, SAT um, CLT, and, and ACT scores, CLT scores are equal or higher ranked as a valuable indicator of students' uh, uh, proficiency. Can you talk about that? Because I, so I guess let me, before you talk about that, I think that's just one of the things I want to commend you for. And that I think mm-hmm. I want to be inspired by and hope listeners are inspired by is, you know, this podcast is called the Moral Imagination Podcast, right? And it comes from uh, the Burke, uh, yep. which is like, we've emptied the wardrobe of the moral imagination. And mm-hmm. the abolition of man is really a reflection on that. And yeah. what we need to do, and I, I had one of my podcasts is a lecture I give. I forget what episode number it is, but something 15 or something like that on the moral imagination. It's just a lecture I give like 15 things we can do to build the moral imagination, mm-hmm. reading good books, detoxing ourselves, resensitizing ourselves to good and evil, um, building community, building plausibility structures, re- expanding reason, all these things. But like one of the things we can do is we can use our moral imagination to actually build and create better alternatives to the deracinated, dehumanized, banal, secular mm. stuff that we're getting, right? That's just no good. And people are unhappy, right? I talk about this with technology. Like instead of abdicating all of the technology to, you know, secularists who, who've, who've never, as your friend said, I've never read Homer or anything. They've never read these things. Let's have classical education. And then those children can go into STEM and build beautiful things in technology. So I think that's what I just want to commend you for. And, and I, I, I want to do better myself and like, don't just complain about how bad things are, build a better alternative. Mm. And that's what you did. So first of all, congratulations. Well, thank you. That means the world, especially coming from you, Michael. Oh, well, you're kind. I, I appreciate that. So let's talk about this though, because I think listeners may be surprised like, oh, okay, the CLT, but actually universities are responding to the CLT and saying it's a better measure of proficiency and college success. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it, it's so funny because, you know, on the one hand, I think the big, big elite universities, uh, you know, they love and hate CLT at the same time. They don't like CLT because we lean into, we're not entirely, but we lean into the Western intellectual tradition. Well, they hate that, right? We do have too many dead white guys for their liking, uh, so they hate that. But what they love are the kinds of kids who take the CLT, right? Again, about 90% right now of our test takers, they come from the homeschool arena. We're about 40% homeschool students. And the rest are coming from great Catholic schools or classical schools or classical Christian schools or some of these great charter schools, the founders and the great hearts down in Texas and Arizona. And and, and um, so they love that. And so more and more, you know, colleges... Uh, you know, of course, you know, there, there's the ones that were very close to schools like TAC or Patrick Henry. Grove City this past year was the number one option for CLT test takers. Hillsdale uh, as well, you know, uses CLT as a preferred assessment over the SAT or ACT. And again, I think it's for two reasons. One is that it's an indicator that the student uh, is going to be able to, to hack it in terms of they have a, an indication of, wow, this kid can read Frederick Douglass or they can read Ben Franklin they can read Plato. They can read these texts from the tradition. But then the other is that it's an indicator that they're probably coming from one of these great schools or homeschools where they've had this rich academic and even spiritual formation that they're going to be a really good fit at somewhere like the University of Dallas. I want to go into this question. I want to go into some of the impacts of the test that you've talked about, but let me, I praised you. So now let me pause and push back and give you some critiques and how would you respond, right? Yeah. So you like, in one sense, you say, you know, they hate the CLT and they love the CLT. So they love the CLT because, by the way, you there's some data you have, right? if you can send it to me, I'll put it up on the show notes and links to your to CLT that actually show, in a sense, like a grading, right? Like where if you get X score on the CLT or the ACT or the SAT, how they compare to each other. Maybe just overview that real yeah, quick before, the, before I become your critic. Yeah, okay. So the, the concordance chart... You can find a full concordance chart on our website site, cltexam.com, and that's going to show you how an SAT and an ACT and a CLT equate. And we have to have that to be tied into the scholarship metrics at all of these colleges. And so one of the critiques I've heard over the years, Michael, is people will say, well, you know that multiple choice standardized testing is a product of the industrial revolution and everything that went wrong with education. And we respond and we say, yes, we know that, but we still think that the SAT and ACT are toxic assessments 
and that they need to be challenged with something better. But at the same time, if we have something that is not multiple choice, it can't be of any use for the way that the colleges currently use these tasks in terms of scholarships and even admissions. And I actually, by the way, so here's one more praise before I critique you, but I actually think that's really important, right? Because let's, after this, let's go talk about the industrial revolution model and how, in a sense, how to change some of those ideas, because I think this is a problem that we have to actually work on. And it's not an easy problem to solve because I mean, in one sense, if you have 30 people in a classroom, you have to manage it. And so it's not a factory, Mm -hmm. but it's difficult, right? But I think one of the things that, that I liked about this when we first talked was in a sense, what you're doing is shifting the this terms of the discussion if you go so far outside the industrial model that you can't have any model of comparison well then now you're just providing a radical alternative that most mm-hmm. people can't use and but i think what you did that was so innovative is that you like in a sense you moderated your goals to in uh, this is a, a theme that i talked about with like uh james madden and others like to it inhabit the world we've inherited like mm. the world we live in is the world of the SAT and the ACT and industrial <laughs> education. That's where we live. So we're yeah. like, we're going to just reject the world. Okay. We can do that. But, and that's where you can do like homeschooling and classic education. There's a lot of, a lot of great things we can do to opt out. But what you are trying to do is actually impact a shift in how general education is not just classical education, but Catholic schools and even later public yeah. schools. And we want to, we want public schools to utilize the CLT Very few have, you know, but at the end of the day, look, if the public school takes the CLT and they administer it to their students, I'm afraid that that, that it might indicate that actually these students who have gone through 12 years of publicly funded education cannot read and understand the kind of texts that are at the very heart and soul and foundations of Western civilization and America itself. I think that's what the CLT can indicate, right? When you're taking the SAT or the ACT, you're not reading these kinds of texts. And that's what's fundamentally different, I think, about it. Right. Well, and that also, if they can't read those texts, it means they are vulnerable to propaganda yep. and to be used. So it's bad. It, that's a bad thing because if you can't read those tests, some, but texts, somebody can, and you need to be able to know that you're not just being propagandized. So, But I think it was also just that so important that you have a model of comparison because what you're also showing is that if you do well on the CLT, Right. It's actually harder in some ways. In many it is ways harder. Than the SAT. Yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned that. In fact, if you look at the concordance chart, people typically get a puzzled look on their face when they look at it because a score of a 114 or higher uh, on the CLT is actually off the charts on the SAT and the ACT. If you're like, what do you mean off the charts? Well, when I was in high school in the late 90s, graduated in 2000 uh, from Severna Park High School in Maryland, there was only about a dozen kids a year who would get a perfect on the SAT or a perfect on the ACT. Now it's 1,500 or more, right? There's been massive test inflation, right? Even with the new SAT, which was released in the spring of 2016, you can look at a concordance chart from the college board comparing the older SAT to the new SAT. And guess what? Everybody on the new SAT just gets 80 points, right? About, depending on exactly where you're at in the concordance chart, 60 to 80 points, right? It's just an easier test. It's been dumbed down, right, to follow the dumbing down of a generation. I mean, so CLT came in and kind of, and, and also this is a way that the college board and ACT have competed against each other in the marketplace for years, because if they made themselves just a little bit easier, then the SAT would be the easier way to scholarships and admission. And therefore they had the market advantage and that would be recommended by college counselors. So there was kind of this race to the bottom. And so CLT, one of the things we wanted to do is come in and kind of hit the reset button and say, you know, wait a minute, what are we actually trying to do here is get a sense of, is student ready for a place like Hillsdale? Are they ready for a place like Thomas Aquinas or St. John's where they're going to be reading rigorous kinds of passages? And do some of the, have you got some of the elite universities, maybe they haven't signed up, but they're applicants send it in, right? How's that work? Yes. And so that, that is happening. Uh, and so in, in all of this within the test optional landscape right now, it's made it fuzzier, like what is and who is and who isn't a CLT partner college because, and this is, Harvard has been been friendly. We've had a number of conversations. Marilyn McGrath, who's the director of admission there, had a, we had a correspondence for quite a while, a couple of years ago. And now that they're test optional, it's, the student wants to submit the CLT 
or a video of them tap dancing or whatever else, Harvard's going to take a look at that and, and utilize that. And so in some ways, the test optional movement puts CLT on equal footing with the college board and with ACT as well. And so a lot of students who are great test takers, maybe they already have a 36 or a 1580, but they also know that if they're applying to MIT or Princeton, that's actually not that impressive. A lot of applicants, if not the majority, have a 35 or 36 as well. And so they'll submit the CLT more and more as a supplemental. And it's increasingly, you know, I, I just talked with the director of admission or the VP of enrollment at Duke the other day. Couldn't believe how much he knew about the CLT already. So I think it's, you know, we're not quite as weird as when we launched. Uh, mm-hmm. I think, you know, initially it's radicals challenging the college board with, you know, leaning into Western tradition uh, and all this. And it was pretty alarming because every trend, as you know, Michael, in education is recreating the wheel instead of stopping and saying, actually, it seemed like America's founding generation had some things really right about education and how they viewed it. You know, maybe we would be wise to take a closer look at what they were doing and why they were doing it. But I, I think more and more, you know, CLT is, is a known quantity kind of in the in the higher ed space. And we're finding that there's more and more friends because when people are honest, they know there's no substance, you know, to mainstream education right now. Yeah, I can imagine like if you're bringing people in, like say Duke or something like that, it's test optional and all these things. And you have, it's hard to know, like, can you handle it? Can you handle this place? Is this the right fit for you? And hmm. not everybody is has the same levels of, you know, educational or like academic skills in different ways in different places. And so like not every place is right for everybody. Having that that data can be helpful, even though there are problems with kind of the industrial model. So let me just be a, a, a critical for a minute. Like you, in one sense, I mean, you'd say, I mean, you just talked about what like the Harvard administration, uh, admissions uh, uh, director, who's kind of friendly with you guys and helpful and thinking about things. But like in one sense, you said like they hate the CLT. Like who are they that hate the CLT and why? I mean, is that really the case? And like, what's the pushback? Oh, there is got? absolutely you know an animosity. Now, I think around some of the things that you've already mentioned uh, that we're we're promoting a Eurocentric, dead white guy trying to hold on and reclaim, you know, which really could not be further from the truth. I mean, truly, the kind of education. This is why Lewis, I think, is brilliant in the abolition of man and using the language of the Tao. I think he's not just, he, he's, which I think he referred, and you would know better than I, but it seems like he's speaking of something kind of like we would understand natural law by using that language, but he's making a universal case for it, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of everywhere, always education was about moral formation, character formation. So yeah, I think, uh, I think maybe that, that misinterpretation, but we do is at the, well, at the same time we have, uh, authors on our author bank, and Ben, you can look at this, two-thirds of all the passages on the CLT come from the CLT author bank. There's been a, a ton of work, debate. We've had Angel Parham Adams heading up an author bank committee for uh, uh, several months now that we're working with top academics, uh, top classical schools as well, to make sure that it's not just CLT coming along and saying, oh, we think this is what students ought to be reading, but it, it really is surveying as best we possibly can a consensus of this classical renewal movement and putting students in front of those, those kinds of texts. Yeah, that's great. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Cause I think, you know, sometimes it's easy just to say they don't like us, but I think you made a, an important, there's an article, which I'll put up. Um, it's actually by you, the imaginative conservative, and I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes, but you say, cause there's a couple articles about the CLT that I'll also put up in the show notes, but this one's by you actually. Mm-hmm. And you say, as I began to immerse myself in the SAT, I was shocked to discover how much the test had changed. Right. And you talked about that. And that the infamous analogies had been replaced with reading passages that were politically charged. And this is what I think is going to go to the point. It's not simply that the SAT has just given you informational passages. It's also engaging in formation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right? And so you say, for example, I came across this reading passage in 2013-14. Susan Glaspell's novel, The Glory of the Conquered. She's an early feminist who presents marriage and family life as simply the total loss of freedom. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you say, now I would have found no reason to complain if this passage had been countered by other reading passages that reflected on the sacredness, beauty, and wonder of marriage and family life, right? However, every passage that touched on the subject had the same perspective to glass bells, right? And so you realized tests don't just evaluate, they teach. And so there is, in fact, a formation going on in the test itself. 
Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Something we say a lot internally at CLT is that testing is not just an evaluative tool, but that it is fundamentally a pedagogical tool, right? Because it conveys what to students, what matters most, what is most important. If students, they're taking the most important tests of their life and wow, right there, they're seeing Jane Austen and Frederick Douglass and C.S. Lewis and Aquinas, that conveys to them these really are the most important kinds of texts. The texts that talk about the fundamental questions about what it means to be fully human. And so there, there is just based on what you put it. In fact, you know, this was interesting. This was a, a conversation I had with a student. It's 2013 and I was teaching AVID at a public high school. It's a college exploratory program for first generation students. And there was a girl there who had, I guess I shouldn't say her name on the podcast, but she had a four inch thick SAT prep book and she would work on it a lot. And she was really excited to be first generation student in her family to go to college, you know. And I remember talking to her one time and she said something like, you know, I, I actually really hate school, you know, but I, I just I want to get a good job. You know, so I said, why do you hate school? Like there's so many amazing things to discover. And I'm, I'm trying to kind of make a, you know, the, the kind of appeal a, a former kind of youth ministry person would make to a student and, and get a sense. And uh, and she said the most bizarre thing. And I, I was scratching my head for weeks about this, you know, and I'm, I'm saying, she says, you know, well, none of that stuff is on the SAT, you know? I'm saying, what about the big questions? You know, why are we here? What's the purpose of life? What does it mean to be happy? Is it possible to be happy, you know? I don't know if these are the things you can explore with, with education. And she says, well, none of that's on the SAT. I thought, like, what a weird thing to say. And I realized that she was looking at the SAT to convey what kinds of things mm-hmm. matter because it's the most important test. And that was a wake up to me of how how young people process, you know, what these tests mean. Right. Yeah. Because, I mean, the reality is, you know, when you're older, like we are, you're like super excited, you know, like you just like, I read C.S. Lewis the first time I read it again, you know, mm-hmm. and we're all excited. Like I, I was, I've been studying biology and certain parts of things. I'm like, so cool. But when you're in high school, you're like, is this going to be on the test? I mean, you're like, I mean, we're just kind of boring when we're in high school. I mean, no offense to my dear high school children or other high school listeners, but we can be a little boring. We're like, you know, we're, we're preoccupied with other things in our life and life is like exciting and interesting. And so just tell me what I got to know for the test so I can get on with the rest of my life. Right. And that doesn't apply to everybody, but um, you know, it's a tendency we have. And so I think that's especially because we have this hyper utilitarian way of thinking about it. Like what's on the test? What are my grades? Because it's not just the test, right? It's like, what do you need to get a good grade? You don't need wonder. You just need to know what's on the test, Mm -hmm. right? And so you don't need mystery. You just need to know what's on the test. So it's beyond the test. I mean, I think this is a problem with with education and even classical education is a problem Mm -hmm. with this, right? Because we have to work in a model of grades and grades matter, right? Because they're not superfluous, but they can often take over. Mm. Right. And so think, like, yeah, totally. Even the CLT, you know, even the CLT, well, you know, everybody did well on the CLT. Okay. Yeah. But like, are they filled with wonder at learning? Mm. Right. Yeah. And that, that's just a challenge. Right. But, but I think the other thing you, you point out in this, in this piece is you say, you know, I also realized a couple of other things that college tests were college matchmakers. Right. And originally, like you had, you met these students and they're like, Oh, I want to go to small liberal arts college. And you know, it'd be kind of fun and I would like to learn these things. And there's wonder there. And then they take the PSAT and do well and then the SAT and they do well. And then they're just like flooded with all these like kind of scholarship opportunities. But in a sense, you're here too, you're taking, you know, students and getting them out of like the human track and like putting them in the technocratic track. And Mm -hmm. listen, there's nothing wrong with studying technical things, but that's Mm -hmm. great. I mean, and we'll talk about technical things in a minute and STEM stuff and it's great. But it, in a sense, it's like everything becomes utilitarian. And so yeah. it's, it's part of what I was saying a minute ago, not so coherently, but that it's not just the test, it's the whole ethos of education because mm. the ethos of our time is technocratic and utilitarian. Mm. That part of what we're trying to do is break out of that into a more human way. And I think that's the CLT has a really important role there. But like talk about that kind of matchmaking thing and, and then in a sense, the wrong kind of focus on STEM. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll kind of start off kind of unpacking this world. And it's been interesting to me that uh, very few folks know kind of how this whole kind of higher ed machine operates. So, but you, we all experience this, you know, so your, your sophomore, your freshman or junior takes the PSAT. And just like you said, a couple of weeks later, a couple of months later, you start to get flooded with marketing material, right? Because higher ed has fundamentally changed. You had basically 
60 years from the end of, of World War II, really till the housing market crash in 2008, of just growth, of just growth, people going, more and more people going to college almost every year during that time, all right? But then something changed when the housing market collapsed in 2008, and you have the first time really a, a contraction, more parents saying, you know what, do we really need a four-year degree, right? Is it really worth it? Everybody seems to have, well, what if we just saved those four years and got an early start in the job market? Could we actually be better off? And so the contraction has been ongoing. Some folks think as high as 30 or 40 or 50 percent of four-year degree-granting liberal arts colleges are going to close in the next five years, right? And so it's happening, it's happening pretty rapidly. So what this means is that colleges are really competitive for great students. And a lot of colleges are going to close, and they, they know that they're going to close. And so, so students who take the PSAT, College Board is, is a company. They're a nonprofit, but ACT does the same thing. They then sell all that information, all of your information, to hundreds of universities. And then the universities then start recruiting you know, your son and your daughter. And that's not a bad thing. And, of course, CLT, we work with the CLT kind of colleges, you know, the Hillsdales and the Grove Cities and the Benedictines in that same kind of capacity, but precisely because they're far more interested in recruiting the kind of kid who takes the CLT than the kind of kid who takes the SAT or ACT. And so, you know, Hillsdale, I was talking to Lee Wishing. He's a, a dear friend of mine. He's a VP of enrollment at Grove City College, and Grove City was actually the number one option for CLT partner colleges last year, you know, and he says, he tells me, I've never seen anything like this, where it's kind of like if they take this CLT, we know that they're exactly the kind of student that we're looking for. You know, it's never been so simple for us. And, you know, when we met with uh, Provost Whalen at Hillsdale, this was 2016, he said this really amazing thing that we still talk about at CLT, where he said that the CLT or, or something just like it could have the power of kind of bifurcating the whole education system, you know? And that you kind of have the SAT track, which, you know, takes you through the public schools all the way to, to Penn State. And then you have the CLT track and you go from a home school or from classical schools and you maybe end up at Grove City or Benedictine or Ave Marie or something. And then at the end of the day, we're, we're saying, who makes the better doctors? Who makes the better lawyers? Who makes the better teachers? And I think that more and more folks are waking up to and I, I want to be really careful of not being harshly critical because there are some amazing people right. in the public education arena. There's amazing teachers who work so hard, but the entire system is fundamentally off the rails. You know, I mean, can you imagine trying to explain to somebody like Ben Franklin a system of education that excludes all classical languages, excludes logic, excludes rhetoric, excludes philosophy, excludes ethics, excludes religion? It would have been inconceivable. Like, what even is it then? You know, right? Well, I mean, this is why Jefferson and wanted a public schooling, and so many of the founders, right, to prepare people to live well with self-government and self-rule. When you do what you just said, you create mass society of people who are disconnected from their traditions and easily vulnerable to propaganda. Right. I mean, and it's kind of that's not conspiratorial. I mean, this is stuff that people were worried about in mass society anyway. Mm. Now you take it to the extreme where, you know, people don't have the ability because they're not trained to be able to kind of think through, wrestle with these questions. I mean, it's a real problem for democratic life. So I think, it, you know, you're dealing with pretty big themes here, but I think that they're very important. Thank you. Yeah. Before I finish, so let's just let go. You, you make this. You make this point. I, I wanted you to maybe talk about this a little bit. What do you think is going to happen? I mean, you you mentioned kind of we have this like very Dewey influence model. It kind of worked, but we're also living off of the cultural capital of a found mm. of a founding of everything. And then we have this hyper industrialization of, of education. It's used as kind of political schooling as opposed to like educare to draw out and to like mm -hmm. prepare you to lead a full flourishing human life, right? Mm. I mean, so like the study of ethics is a wonderful. Uh, it's sort of a Pinker's book on the source of Christian ethics starts with this question, like, what is ethics? What's the study of how to lead a good life in order to be mm -hmm. happy? So how to lead, 
a good life in order to be happy. What's happiness? What's good? What's life? And how do we do it? Right. These are these, that's what ethics and that's what education. And then, and then how do we, in a sense, work with like to use theological language, we work with God to complete creation. And this is where, you know, technology and medicine, mm-hmm. all these, but all these things are about like a flourishing life. What does a flourishing life look like? You know, in a sense, you, it's interesting that you brought up that, that point, which I, I didn't realize that was the contraction date, you know, the housing crisis. But there's a general sense like, look, college is just isn't worth it. I mean, $60,000. I mean, give me a break. Mm. So I went to the University of Notre Dame. I'm older than you are. When I started at Notre Dame, I think it was 11000 Okay. Mm-hmm. In, this is the late 80s. Okay. Okay. And like, you know, UCLA, I'm from California, like, you know, the Cal system, I think it was in the, you know, under 10000 I mean, now... These colleges are sixty thousand dollars, forty thousand dollars. You know, yeah. I mean, even the colleges you mentioned, right? Like, you know, Christendom and Steubenville and they're expensive, Hillsdale. And so you have you're asking yourself, it's not yeah. just like, why am I gonna spend forty five thousand dollars a year, get in debt, and go to college for what? College does give you advantages. Okay. I don't, I don't want to say it doesn't. There's a lot of positive advantages. You can build good friendships there. You can have a real learning experience. You can grow as a person, especially if the college is a good one with human formation. You know, so like for Catholic colleges, I'm Catholic, like I've advised different colleges over, over time. Like the differentiator is not to be more like secular schools because you cannot <laughs> compete with them. Yeah. You need to be a unique place that offers human formation and serious learning Mm -hmm. so that that you're, and then will will my children be able to be a doctor? Of course. Right. Mm -hmm. Of course. So we got to work on those differentiations, but like you're talking about colleges closing, like, do you, what do I mean, this is obviously like, you know, speculative, but where do you see we're going? I mean, like you you see this point I was trying to to put out, like at this point, like, should you not go to college? Well, it's kind of risky not to go to college yet. It's, it's, it's kind of an insurance, you know, I think maybe it's Teal who used that language, like an mm-hmm. insurance you're, and, and you're getting certain benefits to be sure. Okay. And you can have a good education, build friends. but like at some point it's just not going to be needed anymore because things are changing. What's your take on where we're going and what, what do you think is going to happen from your perspective? I mean, you, you're seeing it close up with colleges and the drive to get people in while the prices go up and contraction. Mm-hmm. I mean, where are we going? How should we think about this? Yeah. It, the market needs to contract. Uh, college, some colleges do need to close. College is also not for everyone. I think we've been sold that. The public school system has sold that idea that college is for everyone. Not necessarily for, for everyone. I, I wanted to comment as well about the, the price question. Uh, there's a huge, as, as you probably know with your 18-year-old, difference between the sticker price of most colleges and what, what we call net tuition. Right, and right. so net tuition in many arenas is actually going down. And the reason it's going down is because colleges are having to cut into their endowments to undercut the cost of tuition so much. In fact, Hope College, as you may know, uh, is, is piloting this new vision for paying for college where it's free uh, and that you commit to giving kind of the same way as church. We have President Matthew Skogan on the Anchor podcast to talk about that vision, uh, a different payment that is not the way that it's been done, but maybe should have been done that way from the beginning. And what that does is that it frees students up to go into humanitarian work without feeling like they've got to go get some drudgery kind of job and, and to pay off a bunch of student loan debt. So um, if we don't get the cost thing figured out, then I think a lot more colleges are going to close than necessary. But, you know, this rare uh, four years that young people can get of not being, you know, burdened uh, in, in ways maybe you will with the responsibilities of life, but to explore the richest ideas to be formed uh, at that kind of final stage I think it is really beautiful. And, and I think what they're doing at a place like Wyoming Catholic or, <clears throat> again, you know, a place like Franciscan, it's hard to replicate, I think, uh, outside right. of the, the kind of community that they've created there. Um, and so, yeah, generous donors are going to have to probably get a, a bit more generous as, as I think, uh, you know, the competition is going to continue. Some colleges or a lot of colleges are going to have to close their doors. And But one more comment there is that, you know, when you think about the value prop, what's mm-hmm. the value prop? If education is just, you know, transferring information, why not just do an online degree and be done, you know? But <clears throat> if education is fundamentally about human formation, you know, they start off the first three weeks at Wyoming Catholic College by going into the Wyoming, you know, backcountry and backpacking for three weeks, you know? 
they send them out there in December to build an igloo to stay in for a couple nights. You know, it's hard to replicate with an online option. And so I do think that the colleges that are actually doing the work of forming humans in the right ways, I think those are going to be the ones that actually, and that's already happening. Record enrollment at Wyoming Catholic and Christian and Benedictine and UD and Grove City and Hillsdale. So that, that is interesting. While other colleges are closing and they have dwindling enrollment, that you have the ones that I just mentioned and ones like it, they're setting in enrollment records and application records during the same time. Yeah, and I think you, may, I think you bring up super important points. I thought about this a lot uh, over the time, so it's interesting to hear you talk about it. But like, okay, why go to college? One, okay, if you go to an elite, just to call it a top 20, whatever, top 30 college, okay, mm-hmm. there's clear benefit there, networks, reputation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that's going to last for, for quite a while. If you go to a place that gives you real human formation, it's not just even what you're learning, but all the friends, all the networks, all the community that you're building and your human formation to like set you on a trajectory for life. That's like a blessing for you, right? It can be an awesome place. And I completely agree with you. I mean, you just can't replicate city that experience at Wyoming in the wilderness or, or at Francisco university of Steubenville online because we're embodied, embedded persons. And that's how we learn in community, right? And this is the weakness of online stuff, even though there's a lot of benefits too, right? I mean, like you and I are older, we can learn online in a very different way because it's like very focused, we know what we're doing. But education is more than just like the information transfer. It's an experience as you articulate, I think very well. And so really the question is like, and let's, okay, so we're, we're both Catholics. We'll talk about the Catholic side. You're Catholic, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about the kid. We can critique Catholics now very freely. Then. Okay. So it's just self critique. Okay. It's like a lot of Catholic colleges. I mean, they're, like I said before, they're, if you're trying to imitate secular college, if you're not offering something unique formation, like mm. it's a waste of money because I can go to a government school and get the same thing and online in a community college, I can go to a public college and get it and kind of like piece it together much more cheaply than I can going to that, going to that college. That's, that's like twice as much as like Mm. community college. Right. So again, then, so I think a lot of Catholic colleges, I think are still like they're living, you know, they're living in the nineties. Have you ever seen the father of the bride part two? Oh yeah. Okay. So there's a great line, you know, I'm using all the time, like, Uh. you're like, welcome to the nineties, Mr. Box. Right. Uh. (laughs) Okay. I mean, like they're living in the Uh. seventies, right? This is the 2020s. Things are different. And so I think that's a point. The other thing I, I just want to affirm, which I think is important, you know, people ask me what I think, you know, I taught undergraduates and what do you think about college? And I think there was a part point in time when I was like, it's, it's a waste, but I don't think it's a waste. I think if there's a time for it, hmm. depending on each person, I sometimes don't like to say, well, college isn't for everybody. Partially that immediately can sound like you're not smart enough or whatever. It, it doesn't mean that it means like, what do you want to do? Where are you going? Like, what do you want? Right. And then what's the right place for you to do that? And what are the reasons for it? I think that's, that's, I think the way feel free to disagree with me. Yes. Not everybody's qualified to go to college. Okay. But the real question is like colleges, you might get whatever, 1550 or whatever on your SAT and your SAT and you know, 114 on your CLT and you still might not be good for you to college right now. Maybe it's for you two years yeah. from now. Maybe you should, you know, join the military or go work in it, you know, work in sub-Saharan Africa or whatever. Mm. I mean, there's, you know, whatever it is, but I think the importance of formation is so important. And Michael Scanlon, who was the father, Michael Scanlon, who was the president of Francisco university of Steubenville turned it around. He said, um, that the two most formative periods of your life are zero to four and 18 to 22. Mm. Uh, I don't know if that's, I don't know if there's data, but that's what he's saying. And he said, and what we do is we take 18 to 20 year olds and we put them in like cinder block buildings all by themselves are totally lonely. And like, we don't give any formation. So he really built this kind of household system and Mm. then hired the right professors and everything so that you could actually learn to like have this flourishing life. And of course, I mean, I did graduate work at Steubenville. I did undergraduate at Notre Dame and then went did I lived in Japan Mm -hmm. for a number of years and then came back and did a, a graduate degree in philosophy there. And I remember like being sh- like taken by shocked and, and in a positive way by the undergraduate experience of people and how like there was mentoring and flourishing going on. It was quite, quite beautiful. And I think that's where I think you said something that's really important. Like college is about this four year period for intellectual, spiritual, moral, human growth. And if mm-hmm. that's what it is, it's a magnificent thing. 
But if it's just information transfer or it's a place to get your body and mind and intellect corrupted while you go into intense debt, it don't do it. Right. And, and unfortunately for, I mean, I'll meet people, Jeremy, you know, I'll meet like a nice, like young man or young lady, you know, they're like 17, 18 years old, they're sweet family. And they're like, I'm going to such and such state or so-and-so place. And I was like, Oh, and I'm just sad. Like what a disaster mm. this could be for you. Now, hopefully it won't be. Yeah. And there are many, like, you know, there are like pockets everywhere. So I, I don't want to overly, overly state that, but you know, it's, so often I actually feel sad for the person mm. because the, unless you're going to a place where human formation is taken seriously, it can be pretty rough. Yeah. And I, I think there are signs that families are, are waking up to uh, this sad story where mom and dad give their whole life, you know, 18 years to forming good habits in character and often raising them up in the faith tradition and then it's undone in four, and mom and dad are broke. You know? so are the ch- and, and the students have debt. Everybody's it's yeah, a, yeah. It's a ripoff. I mean, it's a complete racket. Yeah. 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 Well it's said. It's a social racket, an economic racket. The whole thing's a disaster. So, okay. Well, I've taken a lot of your time. Anything like any closing thoughts like about the classic learn test? Of course, I'll put links to listeners to learn more about it. But any closing thoughts that I, I appreciate your insight, your work, and, and like what. You see in the future yeah, of education, just, or what do you reckon? Just a big thanks, Michael. You know, I, I absolutely loved uh, a couple of years ago, you know, getting out to Grand Rapids and, and we got to have coffee for the first time together and then ran into you once again at a coffee shop. Uh, love the work the Acton Institute's doing. Love the work that you're doing. Uh, love this podcast. So just really grateful to you. I get really encouraged when I think the people who are sometimes the most thoughtful about education have kind things to say about CLT and what we're doing. So, yeah, website is cltexam.com. Check out the Anchor podcast as well. Or we are also going to have our, our own our Michael Miller uh, very soon. And um, yeah, this has been great. Thanks so much. Good, thanks, Jeremy. Great. I'll put links to all those things. And thanks for your work. I mean, it's really it's really great. I mean, I like I said when we met, I was talking to you. I was like very I was stoked to use a California word yeah. about what you're doing and your your entrepreneurial educational vision. So really appreciate you. Thanks thanks for coming on the Moral Imagination podcast. Thank you. 